Welcome. And thank you so much for being here today. This is going to be an exciting live today. Um, I've got a fantastic guest, but before I dive into who she is, first of all, I want to say that if you're on here live, please do say hello, because I can't see. It's the weird thing about LinkedIn is I can't see when people are here. So if you could pop in and say hi, we'd love to know you're here. Second of all, the replay will be available afterwards. So if you're on this and you have to go, that's totally cool. We're probably going to be here for a good hour. Pam and I have a lot to talk about today. So you can always come back and revisit the replay. If for some reason you can't find it, just send me a DM and I will happily send you the link. So before I introduce Pam and myself, I want to share what is going to happen today. So this is perfect for you if you are somebody who has been dealing with a, I'll call it a negative work experience, but we're going to call it something different a little bit moving forward. But you're dealing with something in your workplace, in your career, something that's affecting you and it's really stopping you from being able to move forward. Um, awesome. Okay, cool. People are chiming in. Oh, I love seeing everybody here. It's so nice. Um, so you're finding that it is stopping you from moving forward. So if that's you, stay tuned, grab a pen and paper. Pam is a wealth and I mean a wealth of information. So what we're going to cover today is workplace trauma. And to be honest with you, I had a problem when Pam and I first started talking about this live and she was using the word trauma. I was like, I honestly cringed a little bit. <laughs> I really did. I, I cringed a little bit because I don't love the word trauma. But then I realized I'm actually doing a disservice by not calling it what it is. And because I believe these negative work experiences are so common now that I believe they're being downplayed. And when they're downplayed, we're not fully recognizing what they are. And therefore, we're not getting the tools. We need to actually move through them and liberate ourselves. So that's exactly what we're going to do today. So what Pam is going to talk about is what is workplace trauma? She's going to share exactly how it's impacting you, how it's impacting your functioning, and, and really how that may be holding you back. Third, she is going to share three keys, three tips on actually how to move you forward to liberate yourself to freedom so you can move forward and really move into a career that lights you up. So if this sounds like it might be valuable for you, stay tuned, sit tight. So first of all, I will introduce myself. If we haven't met yet, my name is Andrea Horvath and I'm a career transition coach and I help ambitious women really unlock their full potential and land their dream career, even if they have no idea what that looks like. It's really about connecting you with you, figuring out what you want, what your zone of zone of genius, of brilliance, where you are fulfilled, and then going out into the outside world. I was actually in a career for 25 years. I was a certified professional accountant, and I discovered somewhere along the way that it wasn't for me. So I transitioned to this a few years ago all the while being a single parent, raising two teenage daughters. So I'm one of those people who made the transition. So that's me. And I want to introduce Pam now. I'm so excited to introduce her. But fair warning, I am going to read her bio because I don't want to miss anything because it's it's she's just fabulous. So Pam is a licensed mental health counselor in Maryland and provides health care and leadership consulting services across the Mid-Atlantic region. She holds a master's degree in clinical social work and an MBA and is the founder of Grow by Grace Counseling and Consulting LLC. She has over 20 years of experience in the field of mental health and holds certifications in the treatment of trauma, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorders. Pam has a passion for working with women of faith and helping others work through life decisions and discover their passions and purpose. So thank you so much for being here today, Pam. I so appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited about this topic. And just in my work in the mental health world, I see so many people that are struggling with this, the workplace distress, the challenges and difficulties. And what I noticed is that it does parallel some things that I know of in the trauma world. So don't let that word scare anybody. We're going to talk through it. We're going to dispel some myths. And we're going to see if it resonates with you and talk about how to start moving forward. Oh, that's so brilliant. And, you know, I want to briefly share 
This is a topic that's near and dear to me, my heart. I went through, like I said, I transitioned my career and I didn't, I mean, I knew there was problems. I worked in a very toxic work environment and I was eventually fired. And I was, uh, felt like I was going to be threatened to fire many times. There was a lot of bullying, shame. There was just a lot of this going on. And I knew at the time that it was affecting me, but I didn't know fully until I left how bad it was. And I talked to women all the time who break down in tears, you know, who do break down in tears. And so it's, it's really an important topic. And I think this is just brilliant that you were willing to give your time here and share this. So thank you so much. Before we dive in, is there anything else you want to add before I start uh, asking you questions? I think, you know, for, for me, I've had my own experience working in corporate health care. Um, I know what it feels like to enjoy parts of your job, but to feel stuck, to experience distress, to feel unvalued, to go through the motions. Um, and I've just coming from a place of doing that for over a decade and finally breaking free from that. Um, so I'm really super personally passionate about this topic, too. Yeah. And, you know, it can show up in so many ways. Like you can be fired, like I was. Um, you can be demoted, laid off. It can be toxic work environments, like bullying and shaming. But it also can be completely being undervalued for a really long period of time. Like working hard, giving it your all, and completely being overlooked for long periods of time. Like it can show up so many ways. Mm -hmm. Right. Sometimes the environment itself isn't what's so unhealthy. Sometimes it's just, you know, it's not a match for you. And because you know, it's not a heart match for you. That's where the distressful feelings come from. Sometimes the work environment isn't what's really distressing. It's just that mismatch. And that can cause a very similar response as someone who's really dealing in, with a toxic environment every day. That is so important to mention. Thank you so much. Because it does, it, it takes its toll. It really does take yes. its toll. Okay, so let's dive in. So can you explain what, how do you define, how do you look at workplace trauma? Okay, so this is a big, heavy, weighted question. So first, <laughs> I want to dispel the word trauma. It is a buzzword today. I know that people hear it, people use it. But when I say the word trauma, I really just mean a distressing or adverse circumstance, one or multiple. Mm -hmm. And so let me start. What I'd like to do is just define that a little bit, talk about the functions that it has in the brain very lightly, and then how that relates to what you might be experiencing in the workplace. So trauma. Okay. This word is a big word that means something has happened or is happening and it could be a single event or multiple ongoing things that you experience so your perception of the events your experience of that is threatening to your safety so that can be you feel threatened physically so that's that's the bullying um that's the reprimand that's the embarrassment that's maybe some harassment those sorts of behaviors that can threaten you physically. It can also mean a perception of a threat to your safety emotionally or psychologically or any other way. But the point is that the word trauma really is a perception. So let me kind of dive a little bit deeper and give you an example. Say there is a family that goes to the beach in the summer. I'm sure a lot of us can relate to this. So there's parents that are sitting on the blanket on the shore and their children rush up to the waves. Say there's two kids and they're, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years old. And they're playing in the water, it's fun. And then that one big wave comes and just washes over both children. They're tumbled and tossed around. I'm sure there's somebody who's had that experience. I have more than once. And maybe they swallow a little bit of water, they're choking a little bit, but eventually they both stand back up child a perceives that situation as terrifying as threatening to their very life as dangerous they're they're the child that's coming up out of the water choking crying screaming looking back at the blanket for mom and dad making sure they're there because their sense of safety has been rattled they feel like they're really in danger child b steps up out of the water 
maybe chokes a little bit and goes, well, I better learn how to figure out how to dive through day through waves so I don't get washed. Out. I mean, their perception of that same exact experience is totally different. Child A grows up, never wants to go to the beach again, scared of swimming, doesn't want to go near it, afraid of pools. Child B grows up learning how to manage that, being resilient in their response to it, and it does not carry that same weight for them as it does person A. Now, there's a lot of research on the why. I won't dive into that today. But you, if you're on this call, you can have the exact same work experience as your colleague, and they can experience it totally differently. They can not feel what you feel with the distress. Um, or just in general, they have a very different perspective of their job. So don't compare one to another. Trauma is personal, my personal experience, my personal perception of the experience. Okay, so when you feel that trauma, your brain has three basic areas that are developed from in the room on up. The first area of the brain is the back, and that's like the brain stem and spine. And I'm not a doctor, so if there's doctors in the call, I deeply apologize. <laughs> um, but that's the survival part of the brain. It's in the back bottom. It's responsible for responding to your survival needs. And this is, we were, I believe, created this way on purpose, because even from being in the womb, you have to nourish yourself when you need to nourish yourself. You need to move around when you need to move around. You grow. There are things that are pivotal to your um, survival. Okay, so then you grow up a little bit, and the middle part of your brain, which we call the feeling or emotion part of your brain, starts to develop. And so that's when you have the toddler or the young child that screams and cries when they're tired. They feel tired. They have that experience of a feeling. It tells their survival brain and their nervous system, do something, you're feeling tired, and then it responds with sleep. Same thing with hunger. If you've ever been around a child who's hungry, it's not pretty. They're, if they feel that hunger, they, that, that feeling part of their brain talks to their survival part of their brain, says you better get food, you need nourishment, then an action happens and they get the food. The last part of your brain to develop is the frontal cortex, okay, the front part of your brain, and it's called the thinking brain. And this develops much later in life, like adolescence on up. So if you're a young kid, you don't have access to that. That's why toddlers tantrum. They cannot think through these things. So the front part of your brain is responsible for thinking, creating, being rational, mm -hmm. making decisions, solving problems. Okay. So let me kind of drive this home a little bit. The same example I gave with the going to the beach. If the child that experienced that as a threat to their safety, they experienced that as a traumatic event, the only part of their brain that is functioning at that point is the survival part. There may be some feeling of fear because feelings are information. So they may feel fear and that talks to the survival brain and says, get out of here, go get mom, go get, get yourself safe, you're in danger. The front part of the brain is not accessible to child A during that scenario. They can't think through, well, it's just the tide of the, I'm okay. You know, I just have to learn how to manage it. The thinking part of the brain is inaccessible to that child at that time, to that person. Okay, so let's translate this to the workplace, okay? Before I get into that, real quick, the body and the brain don't know the difference between what is real danger and what isn't real danger. So when you are at work and you have a trauma experience, meaning you perceive something at work that threatens your sense of safety, either your emotional safety, physical safety, your sense of self-value, your sense of who you are, your body doesn't know the difference between that being that and you're really being in life-threatening danger. Like a tiger's chasing you. Basically, it's the same thing, right? Same exact yeah. thing. And it, we're, our bodies are made that way because we have to survive things, right? If you step out into a busy street, you don't have time to access the thinking part of your brain. You don't have time to sit there and say, well, maybe I should move out of, no, 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 no. 
the survival part is kicking in. Get off the street. You're going to get run over. Get back. So you're in at work and say you had an, an embarrassing situation at work or you had a reprimand or a criticism at work or you feel unvalued or you're overworked, those sorts of experiences will tell your brain that you are having a traumatic event, that your safety is threatened on some level. And then your survival brain will tell your body, do something, you're in danger, do something. So that can look like a whole plethora of issues, which I'll talk about in just a second. But so I hope this starts to like bring the, the picture around. If you're somebody on this call and you have childhood adversity and now you're 30, 40, 50 years old in the workplace and your boss yells at you, guess what? Your body and brain are going to respond the same way as you did when you were five trying to survive that event. It doesn't know time. It doesn't know the difference. It's just going to respond the same way. Okay. This is so, so key. This is so key, Pam, because there's so many people who say they're in survival mode. It's because yes. they literally are. They literally are. Literally are. Right. And I think you've said this before, Andrea, when you're in survival mode, you cannot think about the next step to take. You can't no. create. You cannot create. No, it's not even accessible to you. That part of your brain is off. The switch is off. So that's why you feel like, why am I just reacting and responding and panicking and getting angry and feeling like crap at my job? Why, why can't I do something to move forward? And it's so true. And then we beat ourselves up. Yes. We're not taking action. We feel crappy about ourselves. And then it continues this cycle and it, and it remains in a cycle until we can identify it and start to work through it, what you're going to get to. But it's just, it, we really can blame ourselves in those situations when the truth is we've got to really start looking at what's, what's going on here. Right. And the other interesting thing is I talk to a lot of individuals who say they feel stuck, like they know they need to make a job change, a career change, or any change, relationship, yeah. they feel stuck. A lot of time with those folks, if they have, if they have, especially if they have like childhood or growing up or previous adversity or trauma, Sometimes, have you ever heard the expression, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know? 100%. Yeah. So you'll stay. Sometimes, it's like, again, your body doesn't know the difference between time and situations, but it does know that the current stress and chaos you feel at work is familiar because of childhood chaos and stress. And it's better to stay in something that's familiar, even if it's harmful. Then to go out there yeah. and make a change and to break cycles and patterns, that's uncharted territory. That's scary. Well, the brain and wants to be safe. Exactly. Yeah. The brain and body want you to be safe and they will do whatever it takes to do that, to keep you safe. It's so interesting because growing up, I was bullied a lot, actually by my family, to be honest with you. And then I was bullied a lot in the workforce. Mm. And it took a lot for me to uh, stand up to that. I eventually did. I had to. Um, but it, it was very reminiscent. Like, why did I create that scenario almost? Because I needed to stop the pattern, right? Right. Yeah. But, and I, I talked to so many people in that same scenario that they're having this really, I mean, difficult work, this toxic work experience. They're experiencing it the same way they experienced it when they were 14. And, and dad left. It's it, they, they tell me their body feels the same way. It's because it doesn't know the difference between time and situation. It's just going to respond for you to survive it, however that works. Okay, so when so you probably have had this experience too in toxic works and work environments. How does your brain respond? What does that look like when the survival mode kicks in? It sends a message to your nervous system to fight it, to run away, or to freeze. And a lot of us feel that at work where you're in a meeting and something goes awry and you have that trauma response of, I need to survive this. And you start to feel, feel fearful. And in that moment, your, your survival brain's telling your body, okay, kiddo, we got to survive it. So you can do one of three things. You can fight it. You can start yelling at your boss in the meeting. <laughs> you can start getting angry and lashing out. You can run away, flight, get out of Dodge, 
leave the meeting, or you can freeze, just not do anything. Just look at everybody around you, not speak up for yourself, get pummeled. It's happening so often. People are so disengaged at companies. So disengaged. They're just they're not even there. It's like they're not even present. And they're just yes. checked out, completely checked out because their um, their nervous system couldn't actually handle the situation is what you're saying. It's a, it's a survival mechanism. It's, it's really a pr yeah. primal survival mechanism. You, if you ever watch like National Geographic, you can see animals playing this out, playing it out. A tiger attacks an impala. What's it do? It fakes dead. It freezes. To survive, it freezes yeah. so that the tiger's like, oh, it's already dead. I'm leaving. You, you but, see this play out yeah. in the animal kingdom too. And it also happens in the, the flight so what I will, uh, people will often ask me, like, should I leave? Should I leave? And there are certain circumstances where I believe if a situation is that bad, you do need to remove yourself. Like, I do think that's, that is a perfectly appropriate response sometimes if it's that bad. But that's often a step that people will take without actually considering the consequences. I've just got to get out. But it's almost like I've got to get out of this. And they have no plan. They've got they've got nothing going on, and maybe not even any support. Or I'll just figure it out, and then they get out and realize, shoot, I don't actually know what I'm doing. But that response was so quick to just get the heck out of dodge, like you said, yeah. and remove themselves from that situation. That's a trauma response. Yeah, you're trying to survive it. Again, you can't think about well, do I have enough money in the bank to leave? You're, there's no reasoning and rationale and thinking happening. They're just getting out to survive it. It's a trauma response. But what happens over time, and this is why it's so pivotal of people that people should move to getting unstuck and what we'll talk about in just a few minutes, because how this plays out over time. Okay, so you have this experience, you know a little bit about the brain and what the body does. But what it does over time is it, it that your nervous system is constantly activated and reactivated when you're not in imminent life-threatening situations. So it doesn't, no, right? Can't turn decipher. Off. You're just, you're, it can't turn off. Turn off, yeah. Your nervous system is always in this heightened state. Always. From Sunday night, thinking about Monday, into Friday. And sometimes people will even say, it doesn't go off on Friday night because I know what's coming on Monday. It's just that much of a cycle. And you, so initially, you'll, you'll feel those mental health-looking symptoms. I'm tired. I can't sleep. I have anxiety. Um, I, I hear a lot of stomach issues, a lot of stomach issues because mm. the nervous system controls the GI track. So a lot of individuals say, I'm nauseous thinking about work. I have a pit in my stomach, a pit in my throat. These are trauma responses. But if you don't get unstuck and you don't move, that constant activation of that nervous system when you're not actually in life-threatening danger will have that mental health sim sy um, symptoms will start happening. And then what happens is your body will physically start to respond. You're going to get sick more often. You're going to have blood pressure issues and vascular problems. It's just a perpetual chronic headaches, migraines, structural mm -hmm. issues, there's a lot of research that the CDC and the WHO does around, the, the World Health Organization does around cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, from long longevity of trauma and not getting out of that hyperactivation of the nervous system all the time. You know, it's something that happened with me. So I'm going to share this because it's my personal experience. I had neck and shoulder and back pain all in here the last few years I was working and it was, it was, I had to get massages monthly or I couldn't function. Like I could not function. They miraculously went away between two to three months after I left corporate, just mm -hmm. all on their own. Just miraculously. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's crazy when I look back at how much I tolerated. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel sad for myself that I stayed for so long as I did. And, you know, I'm a single mom. So it was, you know, I had some different challenges in there as well. But when it can just go away on its own, because you've removed that, and I removed that stress from my, you know, my situation, it's amazing how the body then goes to start to heal itself too, which is beautiful and amazing, okay. right? But you have to get yourself out of that. Right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, as we talk about things to get unstuck that is one of the 
absolute cornerstones of moving past this is acknowledging it, understanding it. You can't fix something you don't know is happening. So really embracing, okay, this is not, uh, you really have to understand the impact, the impact of staying where you are, of staying stuck, what it's doing to your mental health, your physical health. Um, and I and I hear you when you say, and I know there's people on this call that are thinking, but I but financially I can't do it. Mm. You know, I don't. You know, I'm just going to say counselors are not rich, and I get it. I get. I, I've been there. You, you don't <laughs> make too. enough money to just break free. This is not. You know, most of us are average income earners. Um, you know, most of us are not billionaires and millionaires, and I know that fear. But there are so many things you can do just one step at a time to help yourself move closer. Even it took me a couple of years to position myself to make the break. But even taking one minor step in the right direction gave me so much relief and hope that I managed the trauma better. I, I managed the daily experience in a much more healthy way because I knew I had an exit plan. I knew I had a plan. It's exactly. And that's how I did it too. Cause I was building a business on the side. Cause again, I couldn't just leave either. Right. I'm the sole income earner, a single parent. So I had to plan my strategy hundred percent, but the key is to start. That's right. And you do. And you do start to feel relief. Like there is an immediate relief of, okay, I'm actually making my way out of this and it might take a little while and I might not have the pieces right now, but it literally is one foot in front of the other. And I find that the more people and it's something more with me, the more I looked ahead, the more scared I got. Yeah. Cause you're in survival. The best thing you can do is focus on the next step. That, that's it. If that's where you're at, it's the next step. Right. You're absolutely right. And I would say, especially to individuals who have any past adversity, I'm using the word adversity as opposed mm -hmm. to trauma, because mm -hmm. that's a trauma is a heavy word. It really just means adverse experiences that have impacted you. And I think 99.9% .9 of us can identify with some <laughs> adversity somewhere in our past. Okay. Believe it or not, I know you, you may think you've worked through it, but it does impact how you respond to life today in the present. But if you don't understand that and acknowledge it, you're not going to be able to make that step forward. So that's step one. That's key one. You have to become aware. And you know this. So we're walking just... in the keys now. We're walking through the keys now to actually move through this, right? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I think okay. yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yes, I think I think what we're talking about with just taking that step to understand what's happening and to do a deeper dive and to acknowledge it, even if it's just something you do on your own or with a partner or with friends or a support network, however that looks, the best, the best thing that I did in my situation was I started asking people, not only internal to my circle, but people who were maybe on the tertiary ridge of my circle. As you, sometimes you ask your family and they'll tell you the wrong thing. <laughs> they, you know, their focus is like, well, it's a secure place for you mm -hmm. to be. The income steady, the benefits are good. It doesn't make, what are you talking about? You're crazy. It doesn't make sense for you to make a shift right now. And they love you and they care about you, but sometimes that's not the full picture of um, advisement that you really need to understand and acknowledge what's happening. Sometimes you need to ask that colleague, coworker, or friend, hey, when we met the other day at lunch, was I like more irritable than usual? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sort of a question. Like, do, do you, when you, I ask my team, because I supervise a large staff, do, what am I doing well? What, what am I not doing well? You know, wh where am I showing up? Where do I need to lean in? And, and they'll tell you. Like you look stressed every morning. Yeah. Your, your face just doesn't look, they'll tell you and you'll get clues. Okay, this is how I'm behaving. This is how I'm feeling. This is what this is looking like. So acknowledged. I, and I think it can show up in little things. I remember I heard, I took a personal development course years ago and the fellow who was leading it, he said, his indication is he has a squeak on his windshield wipers. And when the squeak bothered him, he knew he was stressed. <laughs> And I think sometimes it's that, like, how much do you let stuff roll off your back? How much do you laugh at little weird, you know, little things that happen in your life? 
But you know what I think is also really important, something you mentioned, like the people around you may not see it. When I was in corporate, we were doing a computer conversion. It was a big ERP conversion. And we were asked to work lots of lots of hours. And I was like, this has gotten to the point where it's really not healthy. Like, this is not a healthy situation. So I asked peers, like, how are you finding this? Are you finding it like too much? Because I'm just like finding this too much. And their response was interesting that they were, I had one person who told me she was taking anti-anxiety drugs. One who was like living on Advil because the pain in her body was so much. And honestly, I was horrified. And I'm like, does anybody else not see that this is not normal <laughs> or, or healthy? And I think that's another problem with this. Like you talk about acknowledgement is that the reality is that there's a lot of people who are living in this who don't want to acknowledge it and who can say, well, this is just the way it is. I think that's changing now since COVID to be truthful. Like this was, I, this was my situation pre COVID. I think people are becoming a lot more aware since COVID, but I absolutely found when I talk to people, they're all like, well, this is normal. This is just how it is. Like, what's kind of like, what's your problem? And it's like, but taking anti-anxiety drugs just to go to work to me does not feel normal. It's not feel healthy. This is not where I'm going or want to go. And it's not a sustainable long-term yeah. solution. But again, yeah. if you're in survival mode, you can't, you, that thought's not in your head. Oh, this is not sustainable. I should probably admit, because th because that part of your brain, if you're just surviving, yeah. it's just not. So I, so I also talk to a lot of people. And so for all the creatives out there who have to like create and innovate, if that's your mm -hmm. uh, working genius, you're an innovator, creator, this is going to be really, really difficult because that part of your brain is not accessible when you are just surviving daily. And you're going to find yourself, you know, very frustrated that you can't produce and innovate and create the way that you used to or the way that you want to. Mm. So it can really start to thwart your personal growth and what you love to do. And that's just, that's when your soul starts to just kind of die. Like, yes. not to be dramatic, but it's true. Like, that's how I felt my soul was just kind of dying. Like, I'm just like, I'm just a robot at some point, just kind of showing up, doing the thing and just going home. And it, you know, I always had this thought, there has to be more than this. Like, there's, there's got to be more. And of course, there is more, right? So, okay. So first step, to actually accept, to see it for what it is. First key. Yeah. What is the second key? Okay, I'm going to get really counselory on you because go for it, girl. Go for it, girl. <laughs> Step two. So you've acknowledged it, but now you have to grieve it. You've got to mm -hmm. let yourself feel what that feels like to be disappointed that you don't have what you need and want. I call it grieve it and remove it. And we'll talk about the remove in a second. Um, but you, yes, it's a sad when you acknowledge it, you're going to feel sad and, and that's okay. And you need to let yourself, you, you need to give yourself permission to be sad about what you are missing. Health, wellness, balance, joy, support. happiness, support. And, and in my situation, it was really impacting things that I wanted to do outside of work. I didn't have time, energy, or even the drive to do other things. It impacted relationships. So like, so when you acknowledge the impact of this and what's happening, it's, it's going to bring up some stuff and that's okay. Don't judge it. Just say, this is what it is. I mean, there's a, I, I, I've had clients go through a grieving period where they just session after session, they would just cry and grieve. And I say crying is cleansing. If you need to cry, cry. It's a release. But you have, yeah, it's a release. Yeah. Um, you know, so, and you have to allow yourself to grieve what you didn't get to have, what you don't have. But don't stay in the grief. That's the key to number two. And I think what you said about not judging your this situation and not judging yourself because so many women I talk to they're exhausted and they're not showing up in their relationships for their kids and I have goosebumps as I say this because there's so much truth in that they're not showing up how they want to maybe they're snapping at their partner snapping at their kids and they're going like 
who is this person who's like being this way? This just doesn't feel like me. And then I feel worse. And so I think this is a really important part is just to see it for what it is. But don't judge yourself. Judging ourselves doesn't get us anywhere. It right. doesn't work. It never right. works, right? But we're such good at that as humans. It's our go-to. It is. And, and you know, and, and just if you stay in a place of judgment, that's just going to uh, perpetuate the trauma response. Because yeah. if you feel judged, you're not safe in who you are, and you're going to start that, that cycle. It's going to just keep going. So it's important to acknowledge it and to grieve it, but you have to let it go. You've got to it's grieve, grieve it and remove it. And so sometimes I'll have folks that I work with after they go through a period of that grief, I have them write it down a journaling. Now I'm speaking as a, you know, I, I, I am not a natural journaler. <laughs> I would rather go for a run than to journal. So however you need to get it out of your head, get it out and through your hands and feet, get it out, get it out in a healthy, legal, helpful manner. <laughs> legal, I love it. Out. <laughs> <laughs> I say, get it out. Um, write down, you know, I'm, I'm really frustrated. I'm really hurt. I'm really sad. I'm feeling very depressed. Pick a date and time, you know, on September 1st, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write this out. I'm going to write out how I'm feeling. Then I'm going to crumple that piece of paper up and I'm going to put it in my shredder or don't do that. That'll probably jam the shredder. Burn um, it. Take it, the pe <laughs> burn it, but make sure it's Safely. Legal, <laughs> safe, you know. Um, but I, yeah, I do. I'd have people throw it in their fire pit or throw it in their fireplace. I'm like, get it out because there is something about getting it from here out of your body that helps your brain process it. That's it like a whole other LinkedIn live. Um, the brain reprocessing. <laughs> but it does. You have to get it out of here, out of your body and out. So grieve it and remove it. That's step two. And that's like, you know, it's interesting because that's exactly what I did. Although I didn't have a counselor telling me that I've got journals, I've got books and I've definitely burned things before <laughs> just, and I do it. It feels, it does. It feels better. And you know what? I've also heard recently, I've got a, um, so I've got a coach myself, right? Like I've got a coach and I work with a lady who does actually uh, nervous system regulation, which is so, I mean, we could go on about this for hours. She says, you know, some people like to meditate, but sometimes you need to grab a pillow and scream. <laughs> do you know what yes. I mean like there's different mm -hmm. ways of actually getting things out like sometimes maybe you need to go and close all the windows right and have your freaking moment like have your moment and just get it out of yourself so it's not literally poisoning your body because that's what it's doing right it's literally poisoning your body so get it out whichever way you need to as Pam says safely <laughs> legally <laughs> Don't harm anybody. Like, don't yell right. at people. Just yell in an empty space or whatever you have to do. Get that crap out because it is literally poisoning your body. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's, this is one of the things that COVID kind of shifted. Everybody started working from home. Nobody had the opportunity to commute. And, like, before that, everybody hated commuting. But there yeah. is therapeutic benefits to commuting. <laughs> because mm -hmm. in that car ride, you can get it out. You can scream it out. I'm a person of faith. So I tended to pray it out. And sometimes the prayer was like, Rah! and sometimes it was, you know, quiet and meditative, but, and, and also, you know, listening to podcasts, audiobooks, like when the commutes ended, mm -hmm. it really impacted our ability to process the day. Well, I, I just, I have to say that because it, it I just, it really, really impacts it. Yeah. Yeah. Having that between time, it's like a between time to shift from one of your realities to your next reality. Like you said, to have that processing time is really important. And if we don't allow ourselves and create that now, if you're working from home, when you process it, well, if you don't, it just builds up continuously. That's right. Yeah. Right. And then you have the experience where it's dinner time and you're present, but not present. Oh, yeah. Because your, your mind is still at work downstairs or upstairs. Yeah, it just it permeates every every area. You've got to you've got to get it out legally, safe, in a healthy way, non harmful. Get it out. Um, and the the final step, which we which can be as extensive or limited as you are prepared to, to do, but it's the get help step. So we've talked about acknowledging it. We've talked about letting it go, grieving it, and letting it go, and the getting help. So getting help doesn't necessarily mean professional help, but I would say if you're somebody who is feeling that you're functioning 
your daily functioning is really debilitated. So you're, you're like actually missing days at work. You're actually n- mm-hmm. crying, having oh. panic, you know, those sort your you're just, your functioning on every level has declined. Maybe you're isolating or withdrawing things like that. Yeah. You need, you need to have a partner, a professional partner who can walk with you through that and help you. So yes, that, that type of help I'm definitely talking about if that's you, if your functioning is really debilitated, maybe that's not you and you would benefit from just some general help with career transitioning, reaching out to Andrea, reaching out to um, other professionals in the field that can help you walk through that too. Uh, Maybe it's a support network you're already a member of or you know of support groups, faith communities. Like I said, I'm part of a faith community. We have small groups around these topics. Um, Very helpful. Maybe you've has, got some best friends that you can really say, I need a plan. Can you help me? I need to do something different, but get help. So that's that's the general step three. And, and then I'll dive in a little bit deeper to that, if I may. If you have resonated with some of these symptoms or trauma responses that we've talked about, whether or not you have childhood adversity, if you're watching this today and you're like, I don't even want to get up and go to work tomorrow. There are some practical things you can do. I'm going to give you one tool and a few resources. Okay, so Please one do. is um, what I call, and I and I've practiced this many times a day because I just love it. But it's called box breathing, and I know it sounds like, oh, that's so silly. And the first few times I did it, I was like, this is dumb. But please hear me; it does work. Box breathing is a method of taking very deep, slow, counted breaths deep into your belly. The first time I do this with anybody, they do this. <sighs> Am I doing it right? <laughs> and like, if the, if the air is going into your shoulders, it, you're not doing it right. But what I do is I say, put your hand on your belly and breathe so deep that your belly expands and then contracts. Box breathing is imagining a box in front of you, four sides, and you do four count breath in four count breath out, four count breath in, four count breath out. And you just picture that box and you do four count in and out. I repeat that twice a day, um, probably two rounds at a time in the morning and night. What that's doing is it's physiologically changing the way your nervous system is responding to your environment because of that oxygen and blood flow throughout it. So if you want to train your nervous system to calm down, and that's the key, you got to train it that it's safe. Train it to calm down. It doesn't know. It doesn't know this is not what happened to you when you were 10. It doesn't know. It's going to react to say you have to train it to calm down. So the box breathing is one thing you can do. There's also, um, there's two great resources. And then I, I know um, Andrea has a plethora of resources to share, but I want to share two kind of pioneers in this world. One is, his name is Peter Levine. He is a trauma expert. You can YouTube, Google search him. He's got 20,000 short videos where he can train you how to do different central nervous system calming activities. He's an expert in the field. He works with a lot of veterans, military, healthcare workers, people that are in trauma response units. I I encourage you to look him up, to look at his stuff. Then there's another one called Whole Body Revolution. It's wholebodyrevolution.com. And this is um, an organization headed up by Suki Baxter. She has her own story similar to what we're talking about today. And she has a lot of shorts on how to regulate your nervous system, how to fix and calm anxiety, how to move past feeling stuck. She does education on the brain and different parts of the brain like we talked about today. So do some of your own kind of be your own champion, be your own cheerleader and look some of these things up and try to to participate um, with some of those exercises. Thank you for sharing all of that. That is so powerful. And I'm just going to say breathing has been a, one of my go-to and I continue it consistently. 
I, I used to do, well, I do yoga. I have done lots of different things in my life, different healing modalities. And that, that is honestly one of the best hands <laughs> down, but most people aren't breathing properly. Mm-hmm. And it's exactly what you said at the very beginning. When you take a deep breath in, your stomach should go outward. Yep. 75% of the toxins in our body get removed if we do that breathing mm. properly. 75%. You'll notice if you're in that fight or flight moment, like I used to do this. So I actually used to do this when I was at work, when I was working corporate, I would, if I had those moments where I was in fight or flight and freaking out and going what that, you know, those moments, I would literally shut my computer down and put my timer on my uh, phone five minutes. And I would do that for five minutes. Mm-hmm. And you would be amazed. I mean, you wouldn't be, I don't think, but anybody watching, you will be amazed at how much your nervous system calms down. Mm-hmm. And I love the resources you gave because what I have learned, I mean, there's a reason why Pam and I connected so much too. I mean, there's just so many overlaps, but one of them is the more and more I do the work that I'm doing, the more and more I am realizing our success, it, our success is so much determined by how much our nervous system is regulated. It's crazy. The more and more research, like I said, I've got a coach now who helps me with this because I want to reach, I want to do more and more things. And every time I even step out and do something new that I'm scared to do, because it's that same fear response. It doesn't matter if there's, you know, passion and joy behind it. There still is a little bit of that fear behind it, right? That can come up. And like you said, from your past, but the more you regulate your nervous system, the more you calm your system down and you allow yourself to feel safe because that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the key. It, it's like, it doesn't even end here is what I'm saying. It's like, we need to all be doing this all the time. And in fact, I've actually got a, an app on my phone. It's called NeuroFit where it actually reg- t- tests my, my heart rate mm-hmm. and tells me where I am and tells me, and it gives me an exercise. Like it actually gives me an exercise, um, breathing. Sometimes it's dancing. Sometimes it'll tell me, like, I'll, it'll ask me all these questions. I mean, you've probably got so much information on the different, you know, sympathetic nervous system and par- all that kind of stuff. And it tells me what I need to do to actually help me regulate my nervous system in those moments. Because strengthening our nervous systems is how we need to navigate this world now. Because it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, even being in a joyful career like I am, there's still stressors. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes. The outside world is getting crazier, not calmer. Mm -hmm. Right. And you have to do the work to train your nervous system. It doesn't know it's okay. It doesn't know it doesn't need to freak out. It doesn't know. Yeah. It just doesn't. You have to train it. That is, I think this is one key you could talk about here is that's just it. It's up to us because And, you know, it's interesting because when I have people reach out to me, guys, talk to a lady a couple weeks ago and I was talking to her about my programs and my programs are multi-week, right? She's like, well, can't we just do one or two sessions? And I'm like, no, because I could tell she was in that kind of fight or flight. I'm like, even if I coach you for one or two sessions and figure out your career, I know you're not going to take steps because I can see your nervous system is not where it needs to be to actually make the change. You know, and it's why I've, created my programs the way I have, it's all about connecting back to you, you know, building your own confidence, building your own reserves first. Yes. Because when you're in the wrong place, no matter how bad it is, whether it's just out of alignment or it's worse, you have to deal with yourself first. Yes. Yes. And as we talked about earlier, just, it only takes one small step to start feeling that relief, just one small thing, whether it's, and it's, it's usually not so much what, 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 what do I need to do? And that, that's a big piece of it, but usually it's who do I need to connect with? That's usually that little first step. Who do I need to connect with to even figure out the step? Like that, that's, yeah. that's really kind of the, the first piece of it. And I want to just say yeah. real quickly, if, if you're on this call and as I talked about a few minutes ago, your, your, your functioning is really struggling. You're struggling. Um, if you are in a place where you feel that you're in crisis mode, please don't wait 
please don't wait to do something about that. There is a, in the United States, there's a national crisis hotline. It's 988, not 911, 988. And the people that answer that, that phone when you call are counselors. And they will talk with you. And then after they talk with you and help connect you to whatever you need, if you still need somebody to come to talk with after that, they'll have a local counselor go to your house or connect wow. with you to meet with you. Now, if you are in a very rural area, they might do that via Zoom or just on the phone, but there's help out there. I guess what I'm trying to say, don't stay stuck. You can't afford it. Your health cannot afford it. Thank you for saying all that. That's an amazing resource. One thing I have noticed, and actually this occurs more with men than with, uh, with women more than men. I'm going to say it. Women seem to feel like a lot of the women I seem to feel they need to have their shit together before they reach out to somebody. Hmm. It's backwards. Yeah. I've got to have it figured out that then I'll get help. No, 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 no. <laughs> Right. We reach out for help right. and then we figure it out together. And that's, right. that's the way forward through so much of this. But I've heard this so many times from women. I'll figure it out first and then I'll go reach out for help. Nope. You're keeping yourself stopped. Meanwhile, time is ticking by. Your life is literally ticking by. Right. Right. So before we wrap this up and thank you so much, Pam, do, is there any questions? Um, Pam is only licensed in Maryland, so she's not available unless you are in Maryland uh, to reach out and get support from her. But if there's any questions, um, please type them in. We'll just hold on for a couple of minutes here. Uh, we're just under the hour. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to me as, as well. I mean, I, I'm not a clinical counselor, um, but I do have resources. I know people, I mean, I've been through a lot of this myself. If you're sort of not someone, if you're in crisis mode, you know, like Pam says, go out to the full crisis. Like that's not going to be me. But if you're just like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling stuck. I know this is happening now. I don't know how to get of it. How can I start to move out? That would be something more I would be aligned with hundred percent. And I'm happy to help you. So um, that's what I would say in terms of other steps moving forward. So I don't see any questions here. Um, and I understand that because sometimes we don't love, you know, <laughs> sharing them online, but I no. just wanted to thank you so much. Um, any final words? Um, you know, this is such an important topic and I'm so grateful that everybody hang uh, with us for an hour and just kind of hear our stories. And I just want to say that if you're stuck, there's hope. You don't have to be in that position. So take just one small step today because you don't believe me, you can break, you can break free. You can. Awesome. Absolutely okay. possible. Thank you so much, Pam. Thank you. Okay. Bye. So long, everyone.